light out everybody what's up everybody welcome back to another episode of the lights out podcast i'm your host josh and in the studio today is my new co-host austin he is back hey, what is up, up man hey it's, it's been a couple be weeks since you've been here huh yeah yeah but uh, it's going to be a permanent thing pretty soon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So at the time of recording this, um, it is December 19th. And actually, there's only two more episodes left for the year. There's this episode today with Austin. And then there's one bonus episode I'm doing this year. In years past, I've taken two weeks off around the holidays and into the new year. But this year, I'm only doing one week off. There's going to be a bonus episode up next week, which will be... I think the last episode I record by myself for hopefully a long yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Austin will be back for the first episode of the new year, which will be January 13th. We'll be taking a short break, but then we'll be back and Austin will be back for good. And I'm just excited to get into next year, see where the show takes us. There's so many different things we want to get into. And I think adding another voice to the show, another perspective to the show is just going to add I know for me is going to make this so much more fun, but for you, the listener, I think it's just going to add a whole new dynamic that hopefully you're going to really like. So the last time you were here, we were talking about the Corpsewood Manor murders, which was a uh, just an absolutely insane case. And today we've got another very disturbing one, uh, to put it lightly. So we're going to be talking about the Superior Universal Alignment Cult. And these guys are, they're they're a cult that basically believes in a lot of different things. But main thing being that Jesus was an extraterrestrial. (laughs) And, you know, it's one of those cults that's, you know, kind of rooted in new age ideologies and, you know, UFOs, aliens and, and all of that. But then there's this whole tie to satanism potentially or black magic or performing rituals and things like that that makes this just crazy um this cold is from brazil and this episode just in general is pretty difficult to research once you say just because of yeah there's not too much on it besides the trial itself um and a lot of people have just disappeared like faded away into the background because i think just so much bad press they were like all right i'll right. fade away for a little bit yeah and so in a lot of countries in u.s this happens happens too but a lot of times when something horrific happens or there's potentially a serial killer on the loose a lot of times the authorities like to try to keep that as hush as possible so that they don't look bad right the, right. the police departments don't want to ever look bad it's kind of a, it's an ego thing it's a you know, it's a control thing. And, and this story is, is a prime example of terrible police work and not, you know, not taking the threat seriously. Cause basically a bunch of young boys disappear and then they're found brutally murdered, mutilated, sexually assaulted. So, so just a heads up, this one is, is very disturbing and graphic in nature. So I just want to give people a warning here at the beginning that we're going to be getting into some pretty gruesome and disturbing things this episode, but it's an important one to to cover because I don't think a lot of people have heard about this. And I mean, I still don't think justice has been served in this case. And the, the actual leader of this superior universal alignment was ultimately never held responsible. And her name is Valentina de Andrade. And we'll get into more with her here in a few minutes, but this this one is 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 truly, truly just crazy when you look at all the different elements involved with it: serial killer, Satanism, a, a wild UFO alien cult. It doesn't get much crazier than this. So that's what we're going to be diving into today. But this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Hell Fresh. Uh, be sure to check them out. Also, another way you can support the show that's absolutely free. Is just making sure you're following us on Spotify, subscribed on YouTube. We'd really appreciate it. It does help the show out. Thank you to everybody who purchased merch during our sale. Hopefully all of that is making its way to you. Um, If you haven't gotten it already, it should be 
getting to you here soon. Um, and we've got some new stuff coming out in the new year, which I'm excited about, um, which will be more on that here in a couple of weeks. But yeah, winding down 2022, it's been another great year here at Lights Out and so much, so many changes this year and a lot of things to look forward to, that's for sure. I'm excited to to see where things go. And I also have, so Austin, for those, if you didn't watch the Corpse of Manor episode, just give you a quick rundown on Austin. So Austin has actually been working behind the scenes on the show for over a year now. Um, he helps me with a lot of the research and writing for the show. And obviously, you know, my brother was, was kind of my co-host and on-camera producer for a while. And, you know, he moved on to some other things in his career. And so I was, I've been doing this by myself for a while and I decided, you know, I really enjoy the, you know, being able to bounce ideas off of somebody else. And in, in a lot of these episodes, there's different theories, there's different perspectives that would be interesting to listen to. And so I thought, what better person than to bring the person that's doing really the deep dive on these episodes um, onto the show. So I'm excited yeah. to have you here, man. I got some uh, shoes to fill, not only your brother, yeah. but also uh, Annabelle. Yeah, that's true. Know, I know. She's still in the studio. We haven't got she she's she's glaring at me right now. Yeah. We're trying to figure out a way to incorporate her into the set. And then we also have another person who eventually I'll introduce you guys to. Um, his name's Daniel, and he is the editor for the show and also another producer who works on the show. And I'm hoping in the new year to kind of expand the setup, get a few more cameras in here, and potentially bring Danny on at times to comment on some of these things. So lots of exciting things. We'll get off of my soapbox here and let's, <laughs> let's just dive into this one because there's a, there's a lot of ground to cover. So this is the story of the superior universal alignment. So during the 1980s, the satanic panic really captured the media spotlight. The mainstream news loved covering the allegations of satanic ritual abuse. There's definitely an obsession with magic, demons, pentagrams, which inspired many to go and take up rituals and ceremonies as a hobby. But the news really liked to build up the idea that everything with occult and satanic rituals were connected to physical and sexual violence in some perverted way. This was because in the 1970s, occultism and Satanism was on the rise, and this put the evangelical Christian communities on edge. They were definitely very upset by this and how this was slowly seeping into the mainstream. And after the Charles Manson murders in the summer of 1969, dangerous cults were also dragged into the spotlight. Also around this time, a man by the name Anton LaVey had published the Satanic Bible. For those that don't know, we have a whole episode dedicated to Anton LaVey and his whole story, and, and it's honestly very fascinating. And I've, I know I've said this a million times on the show, but Satanism, just like any religion, has all sorts of different offshoots. And so there are a lot of misconceptions around Satanism and what they believe. There's different beliefs between the Church of Satan, the Satanic Temple, and there's even more offshoots from there. But I just want to keep that in mind when we're talking about this. But but for those that don't know, the Satanic Bible was basically a collection of essays, observations, and rituals. And a lot of the writings that Anton LaVey did really had more to do with self-actualization and self-empowerment. And these writings became some of the most famous works in modern Satanism and the main text for the Church of Satan. Again, this group, the Church of Satan, was founded in 1966. And then a few years later, in 1971, the best-selling novel, The Exorcist, was released. And the original work claimed that it was based off of a true story. And it became so popular that the concepts of Satan and his demons began to work their way deep into the American psyche. Satan and demons weren't just pop culture or religious characters anymore. They were apparitions in your living room because someone in the house was summoning dark energies during their nightly ceremonies. By the end of the 20th century, many began to believe in the true existence of demons and the dark domain of Satan. Even things like a harmless Ouija board that was once a parlor game became a device that could summon dark energy and contact spirits. With the help of Anton LaVey, dark occult rituals became more and more popular, and for some, it literally became a routine part of life. While most of the people who participated were harmless, some grasped onto the ideology to carry out their own 
twisted desires, which is the same for any religion, right? Agreed. Christians, Muslim. I mean, it doesn't matter what religion it is. It's always easy and convenient to take spiritual beliefs, which are rooted in good positivity and then twist them and use, you know, use concepts, use the, the concept of good versus evil that all religions are, are rooted in and then use it to carry out your own wants. Yeah. Right. It's a tale as old as time, right? It is. Yeah. It is. And Satanism was no different that some were using it for good and others used it as an excuse to do evil. And if you remember in the 1970s, the Jonestown massacre happened. And even though this was a Christian based cult, the massacre sent waves of fear across the world. And again, the public saw what the power and influence of cults could actually do to people. So events like this all led to the satanic panic. Cults of all different backgrounds became a national phenomenon. But many people liked comparing cults they didn't understand to the bedrock of black magic and evil. So by the 1980s, a Brazilian woman named Valentina de Andrade would soon join the cult craze. And superior universal alignment would end up being blamed for some of the most horrific and brutal crimes that Brazil has ever seen. So that leads us to who is Valentina? So Valentina was born in the city of Carazino in southern Brazil on September 28, 1931. She grew up in a small town and most of her childhood life was uneventful. She once mentioned she didn't grow up with any toys or bicycles and growing up her family didn't have a lot of money. In the biography on her website it says that she was semi-illiterate. She says that she could have eventually learned to read and write better but she didn't want to distort her authenticity. It also goes on to say that she was a romantic. She also liked songs and messages that incite dreams. She liked to sing and compose melodies, words, and poems. And she described herself as an extrovert, loyal, real, affectionate, and discreet. She also claimed that during her life, she never practiced a single act of evilness or something that could disturb her conscience. She even believed that she had unquestionable dignity. Which is a bit weird, like, if you're saying, this is my biography, I like singing and dancing, also, I've never done anything evil in my life. It almost sounds like... Red flag, Yeah, you ask me. Anybody that's like, I've never done a single bit of evilness in my life, which, I mean, I think most of us like to think we never have done anything evil, and I guess it define, you, you gotta define what evil means, but we've all made mistakes, we're, all, we're imperfect beings. Right. So... Based on that description of her, she's definitely setting herself up as a godlike figure in a way. Right. Like I've she's never above done anything wrong. Yeah, yeah. I'm above the normal fuck ups that humans do. Right. And I feel like every cult leader starts. As oh, like, right. The I Messiah am, complex. The yeah. Messiah complex, exactly. So when Valentina was 50 years old, which was in 1981, she had a spiritual moment an awakening that changed her life forever. She believed she experienced this life altering encounter with divine cosmic beings. She claimed she was contacted by extraterrestrials through a vision that warned her about doomsday. How many times have we heard that before? But this was her first ever vision of prophecy. But according to the extraterrestrials, they promised her that if she spread their word, they would eventually send a spaceship to save her and all of her followers before doomsday hit. The aliens would continue to contact her through visions, and she would then spread their truth to the rest of the world. She believed she was materialized energy on the planet Earth, and she was a cosmic entity of light, love, and truth. She also claimed that none of her beliefs were native to Earth, and they were all given to her by cosmic beings. And she also claimed that she had material proof for all of her beliefs. But of course, no one has ever witnessed this so-called proof she has. Her beliefs included that Jesus was not God, and she described both of them as antagonistic consciences. In her writings, she likes to talk about energies generated through light triangulations, and her website is obsessed with prisms. Her other beliefs focused on fingerprints and individuals. She also believed in the act of reincarnation, and that there was a way to recover memories from previous lives. Even children could be outstanding physicists, mathematicians, performers, musicians, and gain the ability to speak different languages. 
as long as they could tap into the memories of their previous lives. And she also claimed that she had the answers to the entire universe. But of course, if you wanted to know these things or know the things that Valentina believed, you'd have to first buy her book, which putting a paywall on your beliefs is, I, I think is a completely fucked up thing. It's a scam. It's totally yeah. a scam. And it immediately you lose credibility. Yeah. And, and this is an issue even today. I mean, I find a lot of these, these beliefs that a lot of these cult leaders often preach to be interesting. And I think there's, I think what's difficult about a lot of these types of people is that there's nuggets of truth sprinkled in with complete bullshit. And that's the tough part is because people hear things and you're like, that sounds legit to me, or I share a similar belief and whether or not that belief has physical concrete proof to make it a fact is one thing. But I think that's what's difficult and why people get drawn into these things is they're like, oh, you know, I share that similar belief and it may be something completely positive, right? But then, you know, that's how they suck you in is you start believing in those things and then slowly over time, the rest of it gets distorted and eventually you're brainwashed into believing the crazy parts right. of, of the group. And I don't think she came out of the gate with like the craziest shit to her followers. I bet she started on, you know, a human connection level right, as right. most cults do and bring people in. And then she's like, oh, I have all the secrets of the universe and everything. And Well, and that's the thing too, is it's like they're fishing. They're casting a line and they're trying to see who's going to bite. And once they got you hooked, you really have no reason not to trust that person and give them your money because, you know, they've given you something of value, which might be, you know, some answers that maybe you're looking for or explanation or, you know, piece of information that only this person has. And so you feel like you've gotten something, but then, you know, they want you to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's so many people that pay wallet because now these people are going to pay them money to get additional information, which is going to only help them. And I, and I think that's the difficult thing is I think so many, especially these spiritual cult leaders start out potentially in a good place. Once they, they realize that they can control people and they can manipulate people to give them things and raise their status, give them fame, give them money. And you know, their ego starts getting inflated. It's like a drug, you know, they can't get enough of it. And it just continues and continues until it just shit gets completely out of hand. Right. And I've seen that so many times in, in different stories, especially with these sort of new age groups. Um, we've covered several of them on my other podcast, mile higher who are very similar that have a similar positive message, you know, love and light and, you know, take care of everybody in the earth and there's all these good things but then over time that's not enough <laughs> yeah let's take it to the next let's level take it to the next level and it really seems to me that's what valentina was trying to do because if you go look at their website i mean there's nothing there's nothing about what we're getting in fact they dispute all the claims that they were ever involved in any of this um the disappearance of these children or abuse but from from looking at their website it looks like just like any other church you know they have like a dancing day and they, all their members are like doing the tango or yeah. you know they're getting together and just having fellowship together and it's just like this group of like-minded people so it also looks like that website was built in 2002 yeah. or as something. most of them do which is so yeah. interesting it's like all of the all of these websites for these leaders are clearly like self-made yeah through absolutely. like html from like 2005 or something yeah like, and it's crazy that it's still running because i like i'm not sure of the status of the cult today but someone's got to be yeah. keeping the url going right i couldn't get it to load on my phone so i don't think it's mobile friendly <laughs> <laughs> it's, it can only load on the computer yeah so yeah the the website's still up for this group and as far as we know superior universe alignment could be a, a group that's still still active yeah um we don't totally know because there's not a lot of information about them beyond this story but it is still out there and active on the internet so pretty interesting so besides the paywall to Valentina's beliefs, she was very open to everyone following her. She was very welcoming to gay people. And this was during a time when many major religions were against homosexuality. So she was very open to different types of lifestyles. As far as love goes, the extraterrestrials had given her the divine truth. 
She said that the person will feel an irresistible physical attraction when energetic information is received. And she goes on to say that it is criminal and unfair not to allow them to be happy. And if parents don't accept their children for who they are, the parents are executors. And if they deny how God created them, then they deny God himself. But she also talked about how love and lust were dangerous things. Valentina was married once, but that ended in divorce. And ever since then, it's believed she never had a romantic relationship ever again. She decided to dedicate her life entirely to her spirituality. In her writings, she also covers topics like donating organs, comatose states, deja vu, the disappearance of objects, ghosts, miracles, haunted houses, energy while sleeping, life after death, and energetic loads and protection, which whatever the hell that means. But one of her biggest subjects was doomsday and the world's end, as it is with most cults. When Valentina lived in the town of Altamira, Brazil, her neighbors began to believe that she had some talents and clairvoyancy. They believed that she could see the future, so she became the local seer and fortune teller. People would pay her so she would tell them their fate. When she got popular enough, she wrote the book titled God the Big Farce. In the book, she claimed that God did not exist and Jesus was an extraterrestrial being. After publishing her book, her popularity around town grew even more, and she soon created the cult named Superior Universal Alignment in 1981. It's also known as Superior Universal Lineage, depending on the translation, since her native language is Portuguese. She told her followers that she knew the exact day that the world would end, and she would only tell the doomsday date to her most dedicated followers, which that's quite the secret to, to gatekeep. But one of the core beliefs in superior universal alignment was that any child born after 1981 was a reincarnation of evil, and she believed that they needed to be expunged. To become a member of her cult, if the person had children, they were forced to abandon their children, and the only way to avoid the destruction of the earth was to escape in a spacecraft. But any child born after 1981 could not come aboard that ship. She pressured any of her followers who had children to give them up to their other family members or put them up for adoption. In her book, she states, quote unquote, watch out for the children. They are unconscious instruments of the great scam called God and his evil collaborators. After she convinced her followers that this was the truth, that Jesus was an alien and doomsday was on its way, Many began questioning everything about their previous lives and beliefs. Obviously, this is one of the major steps in joining a cult. After accepting that everything they had once believed was false, they were now open to anything Valentina told them. In secrecy, she kept the doomsday date hidden from the public. This was information she only shared to her most loyal followers. But with so many of these types of people, those doomsday dates that they claim to know is truth came and went, and her followers were confused. But not with Valentina, with themselves. Instead of seeing her as a false prophet, they only questioned their own faith in their religion, which I'm sure there's a lot of manipulation on Valentina's part with that. Absolutely. It definitely tracks with her personality of, I'm never wrong. I've never done anything wrong, and if this doomsday date is coming and going, not my fault. Right, Something right, else. right rather than looking bad, you know, that's, that's always the, the way out for them, I feel like. But they began to believe that the Doomsday spaceship hadn't come to rescue them because they were unfaithful to Valentina in Universal Superior Alignment. They believed it was their fault or the children's fault that the spaceship didn't arrive. Around 1987, Valentina eventually accused her followers of not proving their loyalty and that they didn't believe strongly enough. And if they didn't have total faith in her, they would never be saved. Only if they believed her without questioning anything would the divine prophecy actually come true. It was also around this time when children living near Altamira began mysteriously disappearing or showing up dead. And the big question here was, is this just a coincidence? In 1989, the most inhumane acts of sexual violence against young boys between the ages of 8 and 14 began happening in Altamira, Brazil. Around 19 boys disappeared within four years. 
and many of these boys came from poor families or they were orphans. Some were homeless and lived on the streets and they made a little bit of money doing odd jobs like shining shoes. But the first known victim was an eight-year-old boy named Joseph. After leaving his house, a strange man lured him away on August 2nd, 1989. Hours later, the boy was found alive, but he had suffered some serious injuries and had signs of sexual abuse. Some thought this was just a one-time thing, but they soon realized it was a much bigger problem. The crimes against young boys would only get worse. The next victim was a 10-year-old boy named Oto Neal. On November 16, 1989, he delivered some mangoes to a man in town and the man invited him to eat them with him. After a long walk, the man made sure they were in an isolated area before he pulled the boy towards him. At that point, he took out a strong smelling cloth and put it over his mouth and nose. The boy eventually passed out from the strange fumes. And when he woke up, he felt disoriented. When he looked down, he noticed lines of blood running down his legs and he felt intense pain between his legs. When he looked at himself, there was no doubt that the man had raped him. What's even more horrifying, though, is that the man, whoever he was, had also cut off his genitals. When he returned home to his mother, she rushed him to the hospital. And for the next several years, he underwent psychological treatment and dozens of surgeries for genital implantation and reconstruction. His body would later reject the implant, and he would never fully recover from the trauma. The next victim was a nine-year-old boy named Walda Clay, who disappeared on July 23, 1990. While walking along the edge of town near the forest, he came across a strange man who invited him to help get a kite down from the tree. He followed the man deeper into the woods, and eventually the man put a cloth over the boy's face, which caused him to pass out, just like the previous victim. When the boy woke up, he immediately noticed that he had been castrated and sexually abused. He also had to undergo several reconstructive surgeries and psychological treatment, for the next few years, this violence became a common thing towards young boys who lived around Altamira. The boys would be out tending their family's farm or shining shoes, selling local goods or playing down at the banks of the local river. And then a strange man would lure them away. Since the nature of these crimes were so violent and they happened more and more often, the news of the mutilations got widespread attention. A formal investigation was opened and led by police chief Idair Moreau. At first, the murders weren't linked to each other, and many of the cases were dropped for lack of evidence. But after years of disappearances, assaults, and murders, seven separate investigations eventually opened up. Police struggled to make a connection to why these boys were disappearing. And since most of the victims were poor, police might have thought the investigations might be more trouble than they were worth. The three boys who had survived the attacks were their best source of information, but even they couldn't give them much. The boys that survived said that it was just a single man acting alone. By 1990, the first round of investigations were completed, and that's when the police arrested a man named Rotilio de Souza. He was a known drifter who wandered through city streets, and investigators were confident that he was responsible. But the suspect soon died while incarcerated under suspicious circumstances only a few months after he was arrested, even though police were confident he was their guy. The disappearances of young boys kept happening. They eventually had to admit that Rotilio wasn't the murderer, or at least he wasn't the only one. So the investigation continued, all while the list of victims kept growing. The first few victims were assaulted, injured, and then survived. In less than a year since the attacks began, many of the young boys were found dead or never seen again. The attacks had begun in 1989, and many of the boys who died or disappeared were attacked after 1990. When their remains were recovered, they were often found naked, castrated, and had signs of sexual assault. Some were never found at all. The first boy to go missing was Tito Mendez, a 13-year-old. On January 20th, 1991, he went swimming in the Trace Pontes stream before going to the store. Just before disappearing, an eyewitness saw Tito in the company of an unknown man. After that, the boy was never seen again. The first reported death was the death of a 10-year-old boy named Ailton Fonseca. He was first reported missing on May 5, 1991. His mutilated remains were found 46 days later, partially decayed and rotten. What's even more fucked up is that his body was taken to the morgue in Belem, 
but it mysteriously disappeared before it could be autopsied. Then an 11-year-old boy known as JCB disappeared on August 21, 1991. And then on New Year's Day, 1992, a 13-year-old boy named Jordaili de Cunha was last seen with an unknown individual just before disappearing. And his body was found a few days later, naked, castrated, with signs of sexual assault, several cuts across his skin, and severe burn wounds. It was clear that his captor either tortured him with fire or tried to burn him alive, or assaulted his body after he was already dead. On April 11, 1992, a 12-year-old boy named Ednaldo de Souza Teixeira was found beaten to death beside a local well. Dark wounds covered his entire body and he had died from internal bleeding. And then later that fall, on October 1, 1992, a 13-year-old boy named James da Silva Pessoa was out in the fields tending to the family's cattle. And this was the last time that he was ever seen alive. A few days later, his body was discovered, and this poor boy had also been castrated, and there were signs of sexual abuse and torture. But his body wasn't the same as the others. This poor boy had also had his eyes gouged out, and his hands chopped off. Then on November 17, 1992, a 13-year-old boy named Clubson Ferriera Keldus was found murdered. He was naked, castrated, and showed signs of torture. And then on December 27th, another boy named Ferricio Ferris de Souza went missing. He was only 12. He had gone to pick up a payment from a woman he had worked for, and he was last seen with a strange man riding a red bicycle. Even after the new year in 1993, boys kept disappearing, and the police weren't any closer to catching the monster behind these crimes. This would make it four straight years of murder and mutilation. On January 23, 1993, a nine-year-old boy named Raynan Santos de Souza went to play on the banks of the Chingu River. He was last seen with two men. And then on March 27, 1993, 10-year-old Flavio Lopez de Silva also went missing. His body was found a few days later with signs of torture and injury to his genitals. There was also strange circular wounds that covered his body. They were later discovered to be bite marks. Whoever killed the boy might have actually eaten part of him as well. Investigators also found that the tip of the boy's penis was cut off and his scrotum was torn out. One of the last known boys to go missing was on July 9, 1993. He was known as RFS. The 11-year-old boy was a shoe shiner in the streets and he had left his tools behind at a supermarket, which he normally didn't do. After that, he was never seen again. Investigators later found out that a few months earlier, the boy's brother had previously escaped an abduction attempt, and they figured it might have been the same suspect. Since many of these boys were poor and had to work for a living, police thought that these deaths and disappearance might have been connected to an underground trafficking ring. Police turned their attention toward an alleged gang of traffickers in the area. They noticed the cuts on the boy's bodies looked intentional, like they were trying to cut open their stomachs and remove their organs. Investigators thought that the city's children were being kidnapped in order to extract their organs and sell them on the black market. Police actually caught wind of two doctors who had recently moved into the city. The doctors' names were Anicio Ferreira de Souza and Cecio Brandao, and they had both moved to the area in 1990, and the police thought that this wasn't a coincidence, so they actually detained both of them for questioning. Experts later suggested that the organs taken from the children would have been unable to be used as the wounds were too violent for the organs to be removed and remain functional. With no more leads or physical evidence, the doctors were released and the case went cold. The investigation was almost at a complete dead end when investigators finally got a bit of luck. One day, one of the boys actually had escaped from their captors. He was an unnamed boy who had supposedly been locked up by several people and when the boy talked with the police, he identified his captors. Many of the accused were high-ranking members of society. One was actually a police officer. Two were doctors who were previous suspects. One was the son of a wealthy land baron, and the other was Valentina de Andrade, the leader of superior universal alignment. And this is when the clues began to point towards the cult. This news shocked the community because the cult was small and mostly kept to themselves, but the locals would quickly turn on them. 
The secret things the cult was accused of doing behind closed doors were about to be exposed to the mainstream media. Tales and rumors of ritualistic abuse and cannibalism began to spread, and eventually it did hit the mainstream news. Supposedly, the doctors in the cult had removed the boys' organs to sell in the black market or perform black magic rituals. No one knew exactly what was true or what was exaggerated, and the police were determined to turn the community against the superior universal alignment, and spreading stories about Satanism and black magic rituals was the best way to do it, especially in a time when the satanic panic was a household fear. As the investigation began to unfold, police uncovered another horror. On April 6, 1992, on the coast of Piranha, a six-year-old schoolboy went missing. His name was Evandro Ramos Catano. Five days later, his mutilated body was found in a field near Guaratuba, and the killer had brutally cut off the boy's hair, toes, ears, genitals, and hands. Also, his intestines, liver, and heart were missing from his body. After the discovery, investigators thought that the death was a result of human sacrifice, and many were convinced that this was all part of some sick black magic ceremony. A lead detective told a local news outlet that the boy was killed at a sawmill owned by the former mayor, Aldo Abage. The boy's blood had traces of sawdust in it. Then the killers had tossed the body into the nearby sea, and that's when his bloated, mutilated body floated to the shore soon after. In the news, this case became known as the Witches of Guaratuba. To some, this sounded like an evil group that the police were after. In hindsight, the name of the case sounds like a literal witch hunt. But no physical evidence connected anybody to the crime scene. Authorities then accused the ex-mayor's wife, Selena, of paying $2,000 to the cult members so that they would kill the boy as a ritual. Her husband's political career and business ventures were failing, so investigators thought that they might have killed the boys as part of a good luck ritual. According to the police, Selena and her daughter Beatriz confessed to the crimes, but they later retracted their confessions. The authorities later said that there was plenty of evidence that pointed to the existence of an international network of satanic cults, and the region was heavily influenced by the Catholic faith. The investigation later ran into several problems though, they never performed an autopsy on the body, and there was no forensic examinations at the crime scene. Plus, there was no physical evidence that connected anyone to the crime. Aldo, the ex-mayor, died soon after his arrest. His wife and daughter spent almost six years in prison, but were later acquitted of the murder in 1998. And the daughter, Beatriz, was fully pardoned in 2016. And under Brazilian law, Selena could not be tried a second time because she was over the age of 70. By 1993, the other boys' deaths were still a mystery. Investigators decided to reopen the cases after they had gone cold for months. At that point, they re-arrested the two doctors who had previously caught their attention, and these two men officially connected the case to the superior Universal Alignment cult. The more investigators looked into the cult, the more they noticed that the leader, Valentina, was clearly against children born after 1981. She believed they were evil and violent, so she became the police's new line of investigation. Because of their strange religious philosophy, the cult was investigated for the involvement of the kidnapping and murder of Evandro. They searched Valentina's estate where they found strange ritualistic hoods, almost like KKK robes, and several videotapes of the rituals and ceremonies. In one of the videos, police said they saw Valentina enter a trance and tell her followers to quote-unquote kill little children in Portuguese. Experts later watched this videotape, but they believed she was actually saying Yes, there are more experienced little children. The quality of the audio was too poor for them to understand what was actually happening, and the evidence was thrown out and Valentina's name was removed from the judicial inquiry. She claimed that she never worked with the organization in Brazil, and she had only visited Altamira a few times. She claimed that the last time that she was there was in 1987. Since this was the investigator's last lead, the police chief, Ider Moreau, wanted to end the case because there was no physical evidence. This police chief would later become the federal deputy representative of Para, Brazil, in 2015. And from 2015 to 2020, he would be accused of covering up extortion and torture by police officers, assaulting a transsexual woman, and promoting homophobia. In the Altamira case, he believed the murders and mutilations were committed by people during rituals of Satanism 
and black magic. So I'm curious by now, what are your thoughts on this case? This one is really, really tough because I'm trying, I mean, obviously based on the injuries sustained to the victims and just how brutal they are, whoever is doing this is doing it because, I mean, doing it because they're an absolute monster and they clearly have something against these young boys for whatever that reason is. But at the same time, the removal of organs, the the things that are being cut off, I think do potentially suggest that there is some type of ritual that's a part of this. And just the and also the fact that it is just young boys yeah. versus varying different types of victims. For sure. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. After researching yeah. this, I, it was hard to say because a part of me feels like they were police were scapegoating this cult, even though I don't agree with what this cult is about. I do think police are under pressure to just be like, we got to name find somebody. Someone. Yeah. yeah. And what better person to blame it on than this weird cult that we connected to hating children. Right, right. But I don't know, another part of me, it's just such a mess. Why didn't they perform autopsies? Why, like, where's the physical evidence? You know, there's like so many holes in the case that I... Well, it makes you wonder. I mean, and I know I've seen this with cases in in Mexico. We we covered uh, Adolfo uh, Costanzo. And I think you have to look at just the sheer corruption that exists. And it seems to me like the police may in fact just be trying to cover it up because their own are involved. Oh yeah. And and that's what's so crazy and scary about this is that I, I think you're right. I think conveniently the superior universe alignment was there and they they latched onto that one thing that Valentina said about the children, you know, that they're evil being born after that, 1981. And it's a convenient way of accusing, you know, here's our our, you know, person of interest. This is this cult. But the fact that their own were involved potentially with, with these killings just shows me that they're trying to cover up potentially, I mean, for all we know, there could have absolutely been like a ring of police um or just officials government officials that were i don't know trafficking these kids or that would were a part of their own sick satanic cult for all we know right yeah and it's really hard though because again the the police work is just so shitty like there's just none yeah the fact that there's these brutal crime scenes and yet there's no you're they're not gathering any forensic evidence they're just kind of like Oh, there's another one. Yep. And just kind of moving on with it. And the one huge red flag for me was the body of one of the earlier victims disappeared from right, right. The, the that's morgue. Yeah. How does Which that one? happen? This this just this case smells like corruption through and through. Like for there sure. is a massive cover up happening to try to prevent this from from being solved. Yeah. I mean, it's clear that they're whoever is behind these killings had people looking out for them yeah. and trying to protect them, their identity from being revealed. Yeah. It's, it's honestly scary. I mean, it's just kind of imagine living in Altamira with this happening. Yeah. And especially being, you know, a father or a mother and worrying about your son or, you know, loved ones being safe. And the fact that the, the victims that did get away or did survive, they all report, strange man or strange men which to me seems to to lead more down the police cover-up route you know yeah because obviously these men were figuring out ways to lure these children and i all i almost wonder if you know it it could have been like a police officer in uniform that was luring you know that would giving giving the the boys like a false sense of security like you know, you got to be safe out here because there's, you know, yeah, a killer and, running around. So come with me. And yeah, and as like a poor boy possibly living on the streets, wouldn't you grow yeah. to kind of maybe trust a police officer? Yeah, it's like kind of what you know. Oh, they yeah. got a badge. I'm supposed right. to respect them and trust them and everything. Yeah. Which is really hard to, for 
you know, us to even give perspective on this because we're talking about a very small town in Brazil. And this is like in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Like this is a pretty remote location, I would say. Uh, I mean, it's for those wondering where geographically it is, I'd say it's probably like what, I don't even know, eight, 10 hours north of Rio de Janeiro and the state of Pará. Yeah, pretty um, deep in the Amazon. Pretty deep in the, so it's, and I know out there, God, and we were just talking about this before, th this is the only, <laughs> only bit of knowledge of like what these regions are like is from 90 Day Fiance, I forget what his name is, but um, he ends up getting engaged to this, this uh, woman who lives like in the middle of the Amazon. Like they have to take a boat. Like you can only get to this village by boat. Yeah. And just seeing what life is like there, it's so much, you know, it's, they don't have the modern, a lot of them don't have the modern technologies and things like that. And then, you know, put this back in the eighties. I mean, it's even less than, than it is now. So I just think the, the, there's a lack of resources and likely skilled law enforcement out there yeah. to actually investigate this properly. And I think that's ultimately why this went on for so long is there's a lack of skill when it comes to investigating crimes like this. But also I truly think that the police or law enforcement is wrapped up in this. Yeah. And I also think that was one of the reasons we were talking earlier about this one was a tough one to research and really there's been, it, not a lot of coverage on it i think for that exact reason it's right. a really small a village wanna, out there yeah. it's impoverished you know so mm -hmm. yeah it's i mean there's literally a boogeyman running around there yeah it's, it's just so scary and you would kind of know like if you were the monster you realize that oh no one's really gonna give a shit right in this small town right it's almost like too easy you know there's no there's very little risk for them yeah I'm just wondering if like people knew, you know, the authorities knew the entire time and they just weren't doing anything about it, which is I mean, even more, yeah, terrifying. which is even more yeah. disturbing. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the premier meal kit company. I've been using HelloFresh for several years now and it has made my life so much easier when it comes to cooking, preparing a delicious and nutritious meal in 30 minutes or less and best of all cleanup is a breeze but the best thing about hellfresh is the sheer convenience of it all you got to do is go online create an account through my link and then you can set up all your meals for a month two months three months however far in advance you want to do it so you can set it and forget it and then the boxes just show up at your door all the ingredients are pre-measured so you don't have to spend any extra time prepping and it's literally following like six different steps on the back of a recipe card and in 30 minutes or less, you have an absolutely amazing meal for you and your family. Quality is HelloFresh's priority. Ingredients travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days, so you know they're fresh. And whether you're hosting a holiday party or just stocking up on snacks, you'll find everything you need at HelloFresh's market. From quick breakfasts to charcuterie boards and desserts, it's never been easier to prep for a party or fill your pantry. I love that they now have all of these side items that you can buy. You can swap proteins on different meals, you can get snacks, you can get meals for every time of the day, which is amazing. And best of all, tis the season for saving money wherever we can. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. So you can use those savings for holiday gifts or treat yourself. If you haven't tried HelloFresh yet, now is the time. Right now, if you go to hellofresh.com slash lightsout18 and use code lightsout18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. Again, check out HelloFresh at HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut18 and use code LightsOut18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. But from earlier investigations and eyewitness testimonies, they ended up moving forward with seven indictments. The only way the case could move forward, though, was by gathering eyewitnesses. One witness claimed that they attended a cult meeting at the doctor's house in 1991. Many believe that this meant that Valentina must have been in town that year, even though she said she hadn't been back since 1987. Police actually accused Dr. D'Souza of being the one who performed the castrations on the young boys. Witnesses actually claimed to have seen him praying to the God of Darkness. Police claimed that the doctor tried to stay under the radar by doing good deeds in the public eye. 
He provided cheap health care to the local residents, and he also provided free housing and made campaigns to raise donations to help needy families. So in the news, he looked like a stand-up guy. The other doctor, Brindau, was also indicted. Eyewitnesses claimed that he had also participated in cutting off the young boy's genitals. According to another eyewitness, he was actually seen on the Trans-Amazonian Highway carrying a styrofoam box and a blood-stained machete. He ended up being arrested in 1993 and later placed in Belém prison for two years without a trial. Another man by the name of Amelton Gomez was indicted for the crimes. He was an openly gay man and an heir to several farms and gas stations in the area. According to police, he was the man who lured the boys and raped them. Right after the disappearance of one of the victims, eyewitnesses saw him wearing a bloodstained shirt. And then there was also a fourth man who was indicted, and he was a military policeman named Carlos Alberto Santos Lima. And he worked as a security guard at a gas station that belonged to a mountain. According to police, he confessed to being part of the criminal group. They also indicted another military policeman named Aldinor Ferreira Cardosa, who was indicted for providing security for this criminal group. The heir's father, Jose Amadeus Gomez, was also indicted after being accused of masterminding the murders and the castrations committed by the doctors. According to police, he practiced the rituals for financial gain. And then, of course, the last person to be indicted was Valentina herself. She was accused of being the cult leader and the intellectual mentor for the homicides. Everyone who was indicted, except for Jose and Valentina, were detained. Valentina was allowed to walk free until her trial date. The cases against all of them were weak at best. The investigation also had several huge flaws. Again, no official autopsies were ever performed, and no forensic examinations were performed at the crime scene. So there was no physical evidence that could connect any of the accused to the actual crimes. But it didn't matter. Prosecutors thought eyewitnesses would be strong enough evidence. They desperately needed someone to go down for these horrific crimes. Worldwide pressure on the case was also building, and on September 6, 1993, the indictments were accepted by the prosecutor, so they moved forward with the murder trials. I don't think I've ever asked you this, but what, what are your thoughts on eyewitness testimony? Well, eyewitness testimony is good and bad, right? Because it also depends on when you get that testimony, right? If you wait so long after the incident happens, there's a likelihood that that testimony is going to be less reliable. Then and that's why it's so important to do good police work by getting statements from witnesses, right? right? That's why police go around and get everybody's statements so that they have it written down at the time of the incident. So later on in court, when they're you know, not only can the person read their statement from the original date, but also you know, you can see if there's a change in story too. And in this case, it's just the eyewitness testimony could be anything. I, I mean, there's no way to know if it's reliable or not. Yeah. I'm a, I have a pretty strong opinion about eyewitness yeah. testimony. I think it's, you can't ever trust it. And I know that's a strong take, but um, I think after you see something within minutes, it's distorted in your memory. Really? And, really? Yeah. And so, I've actually found out, I was called for jury duty one time. I never ended up going because I was away at college. So I had to, uh, I couldn't make the You got like case. an exception to, yeah. yeah but. I later looked into it, and if you go and try to be a juror on a case in the U.S., as far as I know, if you say you don't believe eyewitness testimony is credible, they'll they remove you from the jury. Huh. I didn't yeah, know that. huh? That's interesting. So, what about this though? What about multiple eyewitnesses who witness something all at the same time? Still garbage. Really? Yeah. Even if it's like two hundred people? Yeah, I think you can collectively interesting have just a, a core memory that is completely false even if several people share it that's interesting yeah i know that's a so so that's a, that, that's take, a that was gonna say that's that's a bold thing to say on here because that would mean most of the things you know most of the events that we've covered hauntings things like that where where there's no physical evidence but the only evidence is eyewitness testimony so josh is putting me on you're, blast you're getting right you, now, i'm yeah. putting you on blast so I think with so you're skeptical of all of that you would be you wouldn't believe any of that well with paranormal I think it's different in in the context of eyewitness testimony in a case 
So you're uh, talking more of like a court case? Yeah, okay. where like they're bringing actual evidence to the trial. I think that's different than like, yeah, we saw this ghost or something like that. Yeah. Because that this isn't someone's livelihood online. So when, this, so when somebody could potentially go to prison for many years, you're saying eyewitness testimony sh- yeah. shouldn't factor into that. No, we need, you need hard evidence. Because even if I get you that, look back yeah. historically, witch hunts, lynchings, yeah. it's just people collectively like, yeah, we, we figured this out. We saw that guy with this guy and then they, they end up. They were doing some weird him. shit around the fire and yeah, and I, I get that. Need. I think in the court sense, I think it makes sense to not, I, I think it's still interesting to hear. Yeah. Because there is no other way to gather how, unless there's somebody filming the incident, right? How else do you get the, the timeline of events, right? How do you piece together the story if there is no eyewitness testimony? Right. And and the scariest part is that this case is the foundation of it is eyewitness testimony. Yeah. That's the scary yeah. part. Because like if we had some core evidence along with eyewitness testimony, right, then you can, maybe I'd be more down with connecting yeah, the dots. That totally. Way. Relying solely on eyewitness testimony for any sort of criminal case or trial yeah. makes no sense. Yeah. No. And, and that's why this is so just fucked because... There is the fact that they don't have a way to, you know, see if they have an alibi or see, you know, actually follow up and see what they were actually doing that day and gather the evidence from the scene to see if there's any connections there. The fact that there's literally, I mean, I'm trying to figure out what investigation they actually did because it seems like they did virtually none and that it was almost like a bunch of guys got in a room together like, all right. So it's, let's find the pieces here to yeah, make this make sense exactly. for a yeah. for court. And I think that's literally what happened is based on those descriptions, especially the indictments for, you know, the various people, it, it almost seems that's what happened is they're like, okay, this guy's a doctor. So you probably know how to, to uh, remove organs and things like that. So let's just, let's slap him with those charges. That, yeah. that, that explains away the, the brutal injuries to, to the kids and, this person was the mastermind. This person organized the security for the group. And it just seems all too convenient, right? It doesn't yeah. it, it's rarely do cases break down to be I mean, is it possible? Sure, but it just seems very I don't know, seems like easy. A lot, yeah, way too easy for yeah. how serious this is. Yeah. But in the Brazilian constitution, it's up to the court and the jury to make a formal judgment on cases involving murder. But in order to get to trial, the evidence must be approved in what's called the investigation stage. This is where they determine if the evidence can prove a fact in the case, and it has to be relevant to the crime. And obviously, this is where things get really messy really quick. This investigation took quite a long time, and it quickly ended up becoming controversial. There were some decisions that were made in Altamira that were eventually revoked at higher levels. The entire process was put on hold and resumed multiple times and three different judges participated during this investigation stage. When the investigations began, witnesses and informants had to testify. One of the witnesses that came forward was the former husband of Valentina. His name was Dulio Pereira, and he was the owner of a hotel in Altamira. On November 30th, 1993, he testified in court, and all he said was that he saw Valentina in town with a group of friends in 1986. What caught his attention was how these friends acted around her. They play, they paid close attention to her, and they admired every time she sat down or got up from her seat. Hmm. So if you take this as their like first eyewitness coming forward, what is that even telling us? Anything? <laughs> hey, she was in town in eighty six. I guess they're maybe trying to back up the the point that she's like a leader of this cult and maybe they're very they're assuming loyal. that those people who are paying close attention to her getting up and down from the table yeah. were her cult members right and uh, that's so weak man i know as yeah. weak evidence yeah but as the testimonies went on the police chief reported that a maid of but as the testimonies went on the police chief reported that a maid of one of the doctors ended up mysteriously dying She was going to testify as a witness because she had supposedly seen some of the cult's rituals firsthand. Meanwhile, all the former members of Superior Universal Alignment testified and claimed there was no ritualistic crime or kidnapping that took place in the cult. 
Many of them ended up accusing Valentina of coercive persuasion at worst, and that she forced some of the couples to turn their children over to childless couples or other family members before joining. She had told them that these children were negative energies and they needed to be left behind, but that was the worst thing the cult members said about her. Again, there's no... It's... it's I see the connection they're trying to make by saying that in order to join my group, you got to give up your children. But based on what other members of the cult are saying is that there is no inclination of kill your children or, right. you know, because they're evil, they need to be, I guess expunged did come up at some point. True. So you got to remember, she did say expunged. And I, of course the, <sighs> followers are going to try and protect the leader right that's true but as as programmed as you are in a cult this is a pretty bold statement to say that if these ceremonies were going on what one person wouldn't come forward like yeah none of them yeah do you have it like That'd that be, sealed down and this and based on what we know about this cult it doesn't seem like it was you know this isn't like rock pharaoh right like that level of control and isolation and yeah. and just brutality that he he showed to his group it se this seems very different mild in a way compared to that yeah but then again i mean it's it's always hard to know because people are good liars and they're good at you know if there are things like this going on it's still possible that people could, you know, keep it under wraps or not come forward no matter how horrible these rituals were. But I agree with you. I think it's, there's a much greater chance that it, if these horrific things were being done within the cult, that at least, you know, as this started blowing up and the cult's going down, that somebody would whistle come forward. Blow. Yeah. Whistleblow yeah. and come forward and be like, Hey, yeah, this is what happened. You know, or seek an immunity deal or something like that where, you know, you're divulging this information to help take it down. But it doesn't seem like that ever happened here. So yeah, it's 30 years ago. Not even like a deathbed confession has right. come from any of the cult members. Right. So kind of makes you think. Right. And again, like if you go on their website, even to this day, they have the these trial dates in there and they literally say that we were set up. Like yeah. this was a total setup. They used us as a scapegoat for whoever committed these horrific crimes. But we'll, we'll dive into that more here in a second. But a confidential source that was believed to be an ex-cult member had some different opinions on the organization. They said that Valentina's abuses betrayed their mission. She had used her extraterrestrial knowledge for her own benefit, not for the common good of the cult. The confidential source also believed that the true teachings must be purified from Valentina's distortions. But this is as close as we're going to get to the whistleblower for this cult. And there's no mention about any actual crimes or killings or rituals or anything like that. It's merely about, oh, you know, she's just making this about herself. And it's not necessarily about the, the spiritual aspects anymore. It's just about pumping Valentina up. Right. Which I think is valid. But I feel like if there was something more there feel like this person might have been the person to, you know, spill the beans on everything, but they didn't. So it makes you wonder. After hearing the testimonies, the chief prosecutor wanted to dismiss all the defendants for lack of evidence in early 1994. But the assistant prosecutor thought that the chief prosecutor was wrong. He then tried to go over the chief prosecutor's head and quickly get a key witness to take the stand. And this individual was Edmilson da Silva Frizeo. The witness who claimed that they attended a cult ritual at the doctor's house in 1991 where he saw Valentina there. The assistant prosecutor thought that this was an ace up his sleeve, but while the man testified, he contradicted himself. He couldn't give a date for when the ritual actually happened. He just said it was 1989 or maybe 1990, which was pretty, uh, yeah, I don't think you can really take that for anything because it was either this year or that year. That's not specific at all. Right. But in his first statement to police, he had said it was in 1991. Still, the judge thought that the testimony was perfectly fine. And even though the chief prosecutor wanted to dismiss the defendants, the judge pronounced all the accused guilty on June 20th, 1994. 
The defense team immediately filed an appeal. And on November 21st, 1994, a prosecutor accepted this appeal. He said that there was a lack of evidence for the conviction. And when this info reached the news, locals began to panic. A bunch of local social groups got organized in Belém, protesting the appeal. They actually went out into the streets and performed a symbolic funeral and burial of the chief prosecutor, Robert Pino. After seeing an angry mob tear through the streets, he feared for his life. He thought a local mob would find him and murder him. So he quickly fled Altamira and never returned. On December 22nd, the three judges voted to keep the suspects in custody and continue the process. Besides the eyewitnesses, the main pieces of evidence they had against Valentina were the old videotapes. But there were still arguments over what she was actually saying in those videos. So the cases fell apart and they tried to dig into her book for more evidence. And the judge thought the book was relevant to the trial. The prosecutors argued that her book cited spells that would be performed with children's genitals and that these spells would bring progress, wealth, and health to whoever practiced them. Two of the survivors who had escaped their captors also testified. One of the boys said that they were absolutely sure that the person who lured him to an isolated spot and mutilated his genitals was Carlos Alberto, the former military police officer who worked as security for the local gas station. The other boy, Otoniel, told a story about how he was called in to deliver mangoes one day, and that was when he was attacked from behind and passed out after a stranger forced a cloth over his face. The boy was then sexually assaulted and castrated, and he also identified Carlos Alberto as his attacker. When asked why he was now confident to identify his attacker when he couldn't before, Otoniel said, In the past I was a frightened child, and today I am already a man. I assume my actions and I am no longer afraid. Even though the victims identified only one man, prosecutors kept trying to connect the violent crimes to the entire cult. After dozens of arrests and searching cult members' houses, police found guns, hooded cloaks, 100 videotapes of ceremonies, Satanist publications, and Valentina's 200-page book. But after all these searches, they found no physical evidence that actually connected them to the crimes. The military officer, Alberto, was later convicted. But Valentina had an alibi that placed her out of the country at the time of the murder, so she was set free. Valentina then fled Brazil and continued her work with the cult for a decade. She traveled to Las Vegas, Argentina, and Uruguay. On March 24, 1995, the court was shocked to get a request for a new hearing from an old eyewitness. It was Edmilson, the man that claimed that they had gone to the doctor's house for a ritual and had seen Valentina there, and he had given a new testimony. He said that he had lied about everything. He said that he had been coerced by three federal police officers who offered him money and said he couldn't refuse it. Other stories of police torture and abuse throughout the case also came to light. So no one knew who was telling the truth or who was tortured into telling lies in court. The case was eventually taken to the federal Supreme Court. A panel realized that the original case had been absolutely just fucked from the very beginning. So they ordered a new hearing for defense statements and they reopened the investigation phase. They also nullified everyone's convictions. By this time, one of the doctors, Brendau, had been held for more than two years in prison without an actual trial. After he was freed, he wanted to sue the state and he claimed that he was used as a scapegoat by the authorities to hide the major flaws in the investigation. On September 12, 1995, all the other defendants connected to the cult were released, and all of the proceedings were stopped. After hearing that the cases were over, Valentina moved to Buenos Aires. She still had a few faithful followers, but she had lost hundreds of followers during the trials. She continued to preach her truth to the few followers she had left, and she refused to take any responsibility for what happened to the young boys and Altamira. She later created her website, which is filled with her ramblings about herself and her beliefs, and she constantly told the world she was innocent. After this, though, no one really knows whatever happened to Valentina. No one knows where she ended up living or if she's even still alive. And if she is still alive, she would be 91 years old today. But that still leaves us with the question of if the cult wasn't responsible for these murders, then who attacked all these boys between 1989 and 1993? During the awful investigations of the Superior Universal Alignment members, a man named Oswaldo Marciniera was arrested for one of the murders. 
He was reportedly a high priest of Umbanda. This was normally a non-violent Afro-Brazilian religion that combines African tradition, indigenous American beliefs, spiritism, and Roman Catholicism. This high priest and two of his assistants allegedly confessed to committing the murder of Evandro, the boy who was killed and mutilated in the sawmill, but there were still over a dozen murders that weren't solved. After police tried to pin the blame on the superior universal alignment for years, the true evil was still lurking across Brazil. And that true evil was a man named Francisco dos Chagas Rodriguez. And his secret violent murder streak wouldn't come to light until many years later in 2004. But he was a man who had been raping, mutilating, and murdering boys for years. Francisco was born in Northeast Brazil in 1965. He grew up without a mother after she abandoned the family when he was only four years old. His father left the family two years later, and he was raised by his abusive grandmother named Maria. His father would occasionally come back around with strange women, but none of the women ever treated Francisco like a son. And every time his father came around and left again, he was always reminded of the pain of abandonment. When he was six years old, he helped his grandmother sell cakes on the street, and he also helped her with housework. Even though he had three brothers, he always felt alone. He would go out at night by himself and throw rocks at the neighborhood cats to entertain himself. And by the time he became an adult, he met a woman and had two daughters in Para. He then found a work as a bicycle mechanic, and in the 1980s, he moved to Altamira. This was when his dark fantasies seeped into reality and began kidnapping and mutilating young boys. Since these murders were later blamed on the cult, Francisco allegedly kidnapped, castrated, and killed an unknown number of boys in the area. He then moved from city to city across Brazil. In the streets, he would find poor young boys working for money just like he used to when he was a kid. Then he would lure the boys away, sexually abuse them, cut off their ears, fingers, and genitals. He also ended up killing most of the victims by strangling them or stabbing them with a knife. Sometimes he would douse his victims in fuel, light a match, and burn them to death. All of his victims were boys between the ages of 4 and 15. And it wasn't until the murder of 15-year-old Jonathan Viega when police finally began catching on. Just before disappearing, Jonathan said he was going to meet a bicycle mechanic. And that bicycle mechanic was none other than Francisco. He was later arrested under suspicion of killing Jonathan along with 16 other boys. And this led the investigation back several years. They began connecting Francisco to the death of young boys dating back to 1989. And when they searched his house, they found several bones of two of his victims and a few pieces of their clothing. They also found boys' t-shirts that had been cut from their neck, which matched several of the other victims. And they realized that all of his victims were found within 600 feet of wherever he lived in each city. He was eventually suspected of killing and mutilating up to 42 boys in total. Because his killings were similar to the murders in Altamira, he was suspected of killing those boys too. But by the end, the case was already closed and there wasn't enough physical evidence to connect him to the crimes. Still, on March 29, 2004, he confessed to murdering 17 boys, but he would never tell police how he did it or what he did with the bodies. These police investigations were so sloppy and careless through the years that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights ended up denouncing Brazil. It's believed that Francisco might have killed many more young boys, and now he's recognized as one of the most prolific serial killers in Brazilian history. He was eventually convicted of double homicide abuse against dead bodies and concealment of corpses, and he was sentenced to 580 years in prison. With Francisco behind bars, many believe that the nightmare was finally over, but the fact that someone or an entire organization was able to evade police for that long and carry out the absolutely most horrifying crimes had made many lose faith in the justice system of Brazil. Police desperately tried to blame black magic rituals and Satanism when the problem was most likely just a psychopath that had outsmarted them at every turn. But still, there's no definite answer to who actually killed all those boys in Altamira. But unfortunately, the truth has been lost with them. I think what I come back to with this, I think you have to look at the cult, what they were about, what we know about them, which isn't a whole lot. I do see how it's hard to connect them to these murders. I just don't see anything about this cult that, that tells me 
there doing these black magic rituals. And obviously there was satanic literature and things like that. So maybe there was some of that, um, those beliefs involved with the cult. But again, it just comes down to lack of evidence, I guess. Yeah. There's just n- nothing. No evidence. And I mean, that's not even to say like some of the cult members could have been like, mm-hmm. but to try and pin it on the entire cult is that's a bold claim, right? It could yeah. have been like, so those police officers, the ex military police and whatnot were working uh, as security for the group or whatever. Yeah. Maybe those were just the screwed up ind- individuals who were committing some of these crimes. And that's their connection to the cult. Right. But other than that, there's no evidence to suggest further connections from the cult to these killings. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that this could have even been like a criminal enterprise of some sort, you know, multiple individuals that were involved in, in this for whatever reason. I mean, it's, it's always hard to understand motive with things like this or why people do evil, evil things. But I, I think the possibility of it also being Francisco is a big possibility too. I mean, yeah, agree. Just wreaked havoc across Brazil the his murders in other places were very similar to the ones done in Altamira. Yeah, the MOs were the same. Um, it's just crazy to think one person though can get away with that many yeah, without getting caught. That's why I kind of think there has to be maybe some overlap, multiple killers possibly. Yeah, um, that's kind of what I think too is that there's multiple people that are involved in this or maybe there is some underground group and that's just what they do. I mean, right. Yeah, there's no there's no explanation for for evil or why people carry out things like this, and sometimes it just makes absolutely no sense to the to the to the average person. I mean, it just people do crazy shit for whatever reason. I see why Valentina would be upset by this because obviously it paints her in a horrible, I mean, horrible light. Terrible. She's this love and light person. She's you know here to help save people from the impending. Uh, apocalypse and you know get ready to jump on the spaceship and and yeah. go to and and she definitely and leave the had planet. Some, uh, some bad takes on children born after 1981 yeah never that's really what could I just understand go back why to like that but that's so weird too like i wonder maybe is that a part of her manipulation tactic like no children involved here because children make things messy and cold or something be. like it that. must be yeah. my my guess is it's some kind of like just it's easier to control I don't know though. I'm like, oh, is it really easier though? Like, if you look at other cults, they gladly brought children into it. And if anything, it's just another person you can easily indoctrinate. Right. right? That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's just that's a, why I can't figure that. Raise out. them in the cult, and then they're going to be a loyal member for because that's all they know. True. So I don't know. Maybe there is, and that's the thing with this is that maybe there could be this grand conspiracy to this that we don't even understand that the cult is involved. It's a cover for this, and you know the members yeah. are all they're all connected. There could just be all these connections that just were never, never brought to light. It this reminds me a little bit of the son of Sam case, because when you dig into that one further, it does kind of lead you down the road of like, there are underground rings of people that believe that are devil worshipers, Satanists that do these types of ritual killings you know and so it's not the first time that this sort of thing has happened in the world and so i my mind is always going back to the possibility of there being an underground ring uh, of you know pedophiles or people that are obsessed with young you know young children and killing them and extracting organs and whatever uh, other purpose they have for doing this but Again, it, it comes down to you kind of have to believe more in that than look at the evidence because there's not a lot of evidence to back those things up. There's not, there is and there isn't, but that's a that's a conversation for another day. But I do think it's possible that this was a much larger ring in Brazil. Sure. And what we do know is that there's tons of human trafficking. There's tons of sex trafficking. Children are abducted and put into sex trafficking but usually those children are kept alive for purposes of sex trafficking. So right. this doesn't really necessarily fit uh, fit that. But And the fact that it was all boys too, I yeah. think is 
is, yeah. is worth remembering because uh, if if Andrade was against children born after 1981, she didn't specify boys after 1981. Right, right. Yeah, right so that right. kind of adds another layer to yeah, why is a good it point. specifically boys. That's a good point. Is it just a coincidence that she said those things and these things happen? And I mean, that's what they're, I think that's what they're kind of claiming is like, yeah, we never harmed anybody. This is just was our rules for our group. Yeah. And people followed them. And it's hard though, because it's like this happened in Brazil and we only have access to so much information. I wonder if there's more details that's just, you know, Hidden lost in, in Brazilian media that we'll never find and we'll never understand because it's in Portuguese. But I'm interested to see if there's anyone out there listening who's maybe Brazilian or familiar with this 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 case that has some additional details about this because we we deep dive this about as deep as we could go and yeah I was even listening still, yeah. to Portuguese videos and trying <laughs> yeah, to really? translate God. them yeah yeah I mean but yeah it just seems like there's so much missing still yeah like there's so much assumptions that are are made throughout the the case and trial but just there's so many holes that maybe maybe and maybe that's that's just part of the mystery that we just don't know for sure and god it, it's possible there that whoever or whatever group or individuals that were involved in this and maybe francisco was a part of that group and they just caught francisco but then there's others right that yeah. are you know other killers because again there are a lot of times we like to think you know serial killers one killer but there are groups out there and and we need to do an episode on the the smiley face killers but there's potential for underground group who all have the same motive and the killings are all similar or they use symbolic um, messages and things like that to tie them together so i don't know this yeah this one's i mean this one's absolutely disturbing and you know I've, i just feel feel horrible for these poor kids that that were victims in this and they are i i don't think that justice has been served i mean francisco don't even send him to prison he should he shouldn't even be living at this point but it's horrible it's absolutely horrible the the absolute evil that exists in the, this world and the real life monsters that are out there it's just it's scary yeah but we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. Let us know your thoughts, though, on this one. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, let us know in the comments uh, who do you think you know, carried out these murders. I'd be interested to hear your theory. But that is it for us today. Austin will be back in a couple weeks. I'll be, I'll be back with one more episode before the end of the year, a special bonus episode. But then, yeah, we will see you guys in the new year. Yeah, take it easy. Take it easy. Stay safe out there during the holidays. And until next time, lights out, everybody.